why don't we get started? Um, thank you all for being here. And uh, of course, thank you to AAAS for, for having this panel. Um, and I, I will say that this is a panel only a pandemic could bring in the sense that we have panelists from the East Coast of the United States, from the West Coast of the United States, from Bahrain, from Kyrgyzstan on this call. So um, it's a, um, you know, um, uh, uh, making making a, a good thing out of a, a tough situation. But my name is Adam Braver. I'm the coordinator for the Student Advocacy Seminar Program uh, for Scholars at Risk. I'm also on faculty at Roger Williams University in Bristol, Rhode Island. Uh, simply put, and you will hear more in just a few minutes, the Student Advocacy Seminars are faculty-led courses in which students engage in hands-on advocacy on behalf of an imprisoned scholar. Um, and by advocacy, I mean from simply raising awareness to working on governmental relations. Over the life of the program, we've worked on cases from all academic fields, from journalists to anthropologists to, of course, scientists, from countries ranging from China to Turkey to Syria to Bahrain, Nicaragua, just to name a few. As everyone here knows, the conflation of human rights and science is historical and ongoing, whether it is attacking the work and research being done or the prominence of scientists who use their standing to improve society. I don't need to tell anybody in attendance how vulnerable scientists are to being attacked from the political and public admonishments we currently are seeing in our own country to their jailing and silencing in other countries. And while I am not in the business of science, in fact, I'm in the business of writing, I have witnessed it firsthand as my grandfather, a physician, single-handedly worked to relocate fellow physicians under threat in other countries. But today we're gathered to talk about the roles that students can play in helping to protect scientists who find themselves under attack. But why students? While the Scholars at Risk Student Advocacy Seminars offer students skills in learning how to advocate through working and taking responsibility on behalf of an imprisoned scholar, it is also based off a higher premise. Um, and that is that being a scholar, being a learned person, an intellectual, a researcher, aspiring or seasoned, carries a responsibility to your discipline and to your colleagues particularly for those who are not enjoying the same freedoms you may be at the time. While it's about seeing one's field as a community and collective, it is also about protecting the common good, something we presume is enhanced by our thinkers and researchers. And a foundational idea during the founding of the seminars was that students in joining an academic discipline can and should as citizens of that community expect that sticking up for them is part of their responsibility and obligation. Today, you'll hear an overview of the work that Scholars at Risk has done to build a student advocacy community. You'll hear from a student who is engaged in a student advocacy seminar, and you'll hear from the daughter of a scholar currently imprisoned in Bahrain. And I will emphasize that while this may be how we generally approach the work, of course, there are many roads for students to engage as advocates on behalf of threatened, harassed, and imprisoned colleagues or mentors. At the very least, if there's one thing I hope you'll leave this session with, it is consideration that whether you intended to or not, you are joining a worldwide community with an obligation to protect one another and the work. Or at the very best, that you will be inspired to find your path to actively help your fellow scientists who are living under threat. Either way, it is important to remember that in putting scientists under threat, the goal of the authorities is, of course, to silence them, put them and their ideas in the dark, stop them from asking questions, stop them from using evidence and reason, stop them from developing and testing a hypothesis, all of which that bad state actor believes is part of questioning his authority. And what can be achieved through your advocacy work, no matter what path you take? Shining light into that darkness, making sure your colleagues are seen and their voices still heard. We will have some time at the end for questions and I'd ask you to type your questions into the chat function. We'll do our best to get to many, 
to as many as possible um, after our presentations. But first, let's get started with those presentations. Um, starting off is Claire Robinson. Claire is the Director of Advocacy at Scholars at Risk. In addition to the, scholar, uh, the student advocacy seminars, she oversees a team that monitors attacks on higher education in regions across the globe, work that culminates in the annual Free to Think report, the generally accepted worldwide authority on the state of attacks and progress on free expression in higher education. Claire will share an overview of the seminar work, how the, uh, uh, the seminars work, how they work, and ways you might be able to be involved. So with that, I pass to Claire Robinson. Um, so as Adam said, I am Claire Robinson and I direct Scholars at Risk student advocacy seminars and Scholars at Risk advocacy work more generally. Uh, so I will be speaking today um, based on my experience working with students in the context of SARS work. I, I of course hope that it inspires you to um, consider engaging your university with Scholars at Risk. But most of all, I hope that this session uh, emphasizes for you the importance of student voices in human rights advocacy uh, and gives you some ideas for entry points for action. So I hope to touch on these points today. I'd like to discuss why scientists and scholars are attacked, uh, the actions we all can take to support imprisoned scientists, and also why student voices in particular are vital in case advocacy. All right, so first, so that you know where I'm coming from, this is a brief introduction to Scholars at Risk. Um, Scholars at Risk is a, an international network of over 500 higher education institutions in 39 countries. And we are committed to protecting the human rights of scholars and promoting academic freedom. Uh, we do this in part by protecting scholars and scientists who are at risk by arranging temporary positions of temporary uh, temporary positions of sanctuary at universities in our network, um, so that those scientists and scholars can continue their teaching and researching, and so they can further their um, academic work, uh, writing, and scientific work in safety. Uh, since our founding 20 years ago, um, we've arranged over 1400 positions of sanctuary for scientists and scholars through the network. Um, we also conduct monitoring, reporting and advocacy to raise awareness about attacks on the higher education and scientific communities. Uh, and Adam briefly mentioned it, but our academic freedom monitoring project is the foundation of our advocacy efforts. Uh, it's supported by volunteer researchers, uh, faculty, and students around the world um, who help us identify and document attacks on science and knowledge. Uh, our monitoring work provides for SAR um, an understanding of current trends in attacks, and this understanding then informs our priorities. Um, through our Scholars in Prison project, we advocate on behalf of uh, scientists, scholars, and students who are wrongfully imprisoned. And we do this often in partnership with students. Uh, we also facilitate legal clinics and conduct um, broader public advocacy, uh, including through mechanisms like the UN's Universal Periodic Review. Finally, we host online events that serve as opportunities for the global higher education community to gather and discuss best practices for protecting academic freedom worldwide. So through our work helping at-risk scientists and scholars find positions of safety and through our monitoring and reporting work, uh, we have found that uh, scientists are threatened because they raise new ideas. Um, and those ideas question the status quo. Uh, those in power, uh, government or other officials, um, view these ideas as threatening to their positions of power. Uh, scientists and scholars are also attacked because of their position in society. Uh, when people, when they speak out, people listen, um, further intimidating those in power. Uh, we've also learned that threats to scientists occur nearly every day. Uh, last year, we reported on 324 
attacks on scholars, scientists, and students in the 2018-19 academic year. That's more than one attack per weekday. Uh, and these are only the attacks we learn of in the media, the, the online media explicitly, and the ones we can verify with other sources. Um, so we believe that threats of scientists are severely underreported. All right, I did mention our monitoring project already, uh, but it gets a, its own slide um, just so that you can see what we consider to be an attack. Um, and I just want to flag here uh, that uh, imprisonments and prosecutions are included in this list. Uh, so today we are going to be discussing advocacy and support of imprisoned scientists. And I just wanted to share that we often learn of these cases through our monitoring efforts. All right, Scholars at Risk um, conducts advocacy on behalf of scholars, scientists, and students under threat, uh, as well as against systemic threats. Uh, as an NGO, we issue our own letters to government officials, sign statements to raise awareness, and encourage our network to take action as well, um, through letters of their own, on social media, uh, seeking meetings with their own government officials, and we also partner with students in the form of classes, clinics, and student groups. Um, because we are a global network with members in 39 countries, we leverage that network to increase the number and diversity of voices seeking a scientist's release. So scientists from all over the world and from every discipline can face threats. Here are um, just four who have been imprisoned, uh, either as a result of their scientific and academic work or for exercising their right to free expression. Um, you will notice that one of the photos is the same as um, the poster that is hanging behind Fatima al Hawachi's, um, behind Fatima al Hawachi on the video. Uh, and she'll be talking about her father, Dr. Khalil al Hawachi later. Um, he's a scholar of electrical engineering who's been in prison in Bahrain since 2014, um, serving a 10-year sentence, and he was detained primarily for his expression. Uh, so we're lucky to have Fatima on this panel, and she'll discuss that more um, in a few minutes. Uh, Nilofar Bayani um, is a conservationist who was conducting field research in Iran um, when she and her colleagues were arrested, and that was in January 2018. Uh, she was convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison um, on espionage charges. Dr. Ahmad Reza Jalali is a scholar of disaster medicine who was in Iran in 2016, uh, visiting from Italy where he was teaching uh, to participate in workshops at universities there when he was arrested. Uh, he was wrongfully convicted in 2017 and sentenced to death. Uh, his, de or his health is uh, rapidly deteriorating and he continues to be denied medical care uh, while his sentence could be carried out at any, any time. And Professor Ilham Toti is an economist uh, in China who was convicted on charges of separatism and sentenced to life in prison uh, for his economics work, much of which he published online. His family uh, hasn't received any news of him or his whereabouts uh, since 2017. So scientists like these are the focus of our case advocacy. Um, successful advocacy campaigns uh, reach a wide range of stakeholders, government officials, leaders of scientific and academic communities, um, intergovernmental bodies like the UN uh, and the press among others. Students are vital to raising awareness for imprisoned scientists because they have the ear of their universities, um, the ear of their government representatives. Uh, they have access to academic association chapters and student groups. Uh, students also understand new media <laughs> much better than most of us in the human rights field uh, and can use social media in particular in uh, creating effective campaigns. Uh, I, I can say honestly, I've learned as, at least as much from the students I've worked with as they have hopefully learned from me. Uh, we very much value the creativity they bring to our adv advocacy campaigns. Um, and I should also mention that connections with students around the globe help support 
scientists' family members. And I'm sure Fatima will um, attest to this later. There are multiple ways to get involved in advocacy for imprisoned scientists and scholars. Uh, so for those of you at universities, uh, consider joining or facilitating a student advocacy seminar on your campus. If this interests you, uh, feel free to reach out to me um, after the session. Uh, but there are other ways too. Campus clubs or chapters of academic associations like AAAS or NGOs like Amnesty are also a great way to get involved. Uh, Discipline-based association chapters um, often take interest when scientists in their specific field are under threat and can take action. Um, I should also mention that if there is an avenue for collective action rather than individual action, this will make engagement easier as there's already an audience to draw from um, and the message will be projected further. Um, that being said, I would not discourage you from individual action if that's your only route. Uh, so in terms of steps, groups or individuals can take, um, you can write an op-ed for a campus or a local paper or invite a journalist to learn about your involvement in a case. Uh, you can approach your university rector or president and ask them to consider signing a letter of appeal, writing their own, or even being quoted in an article. Uh, reach out to your representatives in Congress if you're in the US or your national government and let them know that you're concerned. So I've been lucky enough to work with some uh, really amazing students over the years and to be either part of or witness to their efforts uh, to help imprisoned scientists. And I just wanted to share a few of the ways that they've taken action. Uh, so this is a you know, long list that you guys can read through, but uh, I wanna share a couple of anecdotes. So one group of students, uh, I think about a year and a half ago, took it upon themselves to ensure that uh, the United States government took action in support of Ilham Toti, the economist mentioned earlier. Um, we helped connect the students to the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission in US Congress which hosts a Defending Freedoms Project, which is an effort to essentially match members of Congress with prisoners of conscience. Um, the members of Congress then commit to conducting advocacy on behalf of the prisoner of conscience with the support of the Tom Lantos Commission and support of the nominating NGO. So in this case, Scholars at Risk. So SAR made this nomination of Toti to the commission while students in Rhode Island, actually Adam's class, uh, our moderator today, um, reached out to their representatives uh, to see if they would consider taking on the case. Um, they held virtual meetings and phone calls. They had a visit with the congressman's office and eventually were um, able to connect uh, Representative Langevin um, to Toti's daughter uh, which essentially sealed the deal. Uh, so the students were successful and now Ilham Toti has a formal advocate in US Congress. Uh, so just a, a very happy end to a, or I guess not end, development in a case that is ongoing and very difficult to find good news in. Um, so another group of students uh, newly experiencing lockdown in March, uh, realized that COVID would impact imprisoned scholars more than others. Uh, so they wanted to find a way to conduct advocacy despite the fact that they were no longer on their campus in the UK. Uh, they also realized that the general public had a new empathy for the concept of being stuck in one place. And so they developed a podcast to raise awareness about a professor in India uh, and highlighted concerns about COVID in prisons um, and also focused on the theme of not being able to go anywhere, um, which I found to be very, very creative and very powerful. Uh, another group of students sought a meeting with their university president to share with him about their work in support of an imprisoned scientist. And they asked him to mention, that, uh, to mention their work in his commencement remarks, which he did. So these are just a few ways that students have made a difference in these cases. So I would like to close um, by sharing the words of a professor of chemistry 
who was in prison for over a year for his work and for his expression. Uh, students worked for his release and he wrote to their professor when he was allowed to return home. Uh, so he says, I am writing this letter with my warmest greetings to thank you for your ceaseless support and solidarity while I was unjustly imprisoned. I was told of all your solidarity actions during the year. You and your students have shown the best humanitarian action and responsibility in this unfair world. You have shown that falling short of doing what is necessary to defend human rights is not acceptable. Your actions remind the violators of human rights laws that the world is watching them and objects to their behaviors. I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to you and your students. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Claire, I'd like to use my interlocutor's prerogative and ask you two quick questions before we move to our next presentation. Sure. Um, the, the first, which I think people um, often wonder about in these conversations is, and, and you mentioned some of this comes through the monitoring work, how the cases come to you and how they're prioritized, if, you know, given the hundreds and hundreds of attacks, how to, how to um, that's question one. Sure. Well, yes, some of them come to us through our monitoring project. Um, we have an internal smart search technology set up to identify reports in the media, um, reports issued by governments, trans radio transcripts, um, anything that is publicly pub published, press releases. Um, and we have developed feeds that identify cases of imprisoned scientists and scholars. Um, we also have um, a number of different feeds that you know flag other types of attacks for us. So those come to us automatically every day. Um, and we often find out through that smart search technology. That being said, we also have a network of over 500 institutions around the world. And we're in touch with at least one person in most cases, you know, a dozen, um, you know, or, you know, or in some cases, a dozen, I would say at that university. And so we hear when colleagues are facing troubles, when colleagues have gone to do field research, to do lab work, to do a presentation and don't come home or they haven't been heard from. Uh, and so we rely very much on our network and on the monitoring project. And then together, we feel like we capture um, at least the best known, you know, at, at least most of the cases of imprisoned academics and scientists, um, but I'm sure we're not capturing all of them. Um, you also asked about prioritization. Yes, yeah. um, so we tend to prioritize 10, 12 to 15 cases at a time, uh, mainly because of staffing concerns. Uh, and we want to go deep with each case instead of just sk skimming the surface. So the way that we prioritize, we have a full assessment process of each case that includes like, determining you know, how grave the attack is. And that, you know, so in some cases you might have somebody who was detained and then released on bail or released pending trial. And so, you know, the cases that we take on are those where they're either in prison or they are going to be in prison because they're in a place where there's no way that the trial will actually um, you know, give them any other result. Um, but we also look to those cases where we as a university network with academics, with students, with scientists involved in this work can make a difference. In some cases, there isn't really a higher ed angle. Um, somebody might be more of a public intellectual um, and the higher ed community's voice isn't as strong as it would be in another case. So we prioritize the cases where we feel like this community can make an explicit difference. Um, and so I, I would also just say on a practical level, we also prioritize those where we can get in touch with the family so that we know what they want. We also prioritize those where uh, we might have uh, some sort of connection that would be more helpful than in other cases. So that's a really vague requirement, but let me give you an example. So um, Dr. Ahmad Reza Jalali, for example, he's a uh, honorary citizen of a number of uh, cities in Italy. He's also a Swedish citizen 
And so we have natural avenues for advocacy there. And because we have Italian and Swedish members in our network, we can explore whether those avenues will be helpful. Um, so if there's an angle like that, that um, makes Scholars at Risk a good advocacy partner, then it raises the case up in our list. Well, thank you. You kind of answered my second question in, in, in that answer, and, but I was going to ask also about American Train because so many of the, 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 the scholars um, have, have, some, have had some American training and connections to American universities as well, which I presume makes those universities potentially um, strong advocates, um, particularly in terms of raising awareness in the United States about somebody, say, in another country. I, I, yes, I like to believe everybody wants to help all the universities uh, who have had staff or faculty or students detained. I do believe that they want to help. In some cases, they want our help, and in some cases, they don't, and um, they have their reasons for that. Uh, so uh, I personally um, you know, believe that speaking out is always better than not, um, but others have other opinions on that as well. Well, thank you. And, um, and again, I will emphasize to everybody that we will have time for um, you to ask questions um, after the next two, two presentations. And um, if you didn't see in the chat, um, it, you know, certainly if you want to ask them live, that is fine as well. Just, just please use the raise hand function so we can know, uh, so we don't uh, inadvertently overlook you. Um, so let's switch to the, uh, a student per, um, perspective. Um, and for that, we have um, Ariza Karaktova was joining us from Kyrgyzstan, and she lives just outside of Bishkek, about an hour north. Um, she is a student at the American University of Central Asia, um, studying political science, and I came to know Ariza through a summer seminar I co-taught that included students from around the world. Um, one of the key scholars her class worked on, who Claire just um, 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 told you about, was the Uyghur economist Ilham Todi, um, who again was um, just for context, again, was widely viewed globally as a moderate voice dedicated to bridging the gap between Uyghur, Uyghur and Han um, in China, um, but instead was considered to be a threat to Chinese authorities. It resulted in a life sentence for him um, under a universally accepted bogus charge of separatism uh, and was the first such sentence for a prisoner of conscience in China. Ariza will share experience as a student in, an, in a seminar, um, talk about how they plan their strategy um, and ultimately what it meant for her as well. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Ariza and I will tell you about student perspective conducting advocacy as a student challenges and lessons that I have learned. So as this summer I was engaged in course organized by Open Society University Network with an aim of advocacy activity to protect Uyghur scholars in China. And there were a few reasons why I decided to uh, participate in this course. First, um, I was interested what does academic freedom mean and who does have this right and why someone who enjoys this right can be charged or can be followed. However, after um, reading the description of the course, my main question was what tiny human can do? Saying tiny, I mean me as a student who has no power, who has no connection to politics, who has no experience in advocacy, how I can help those people uh, in China, uh, like China, which is a very uh, developed country in the political perspective and economical perspective. And I will try to answer this question in the end of my presentation. So simply saying interest led me to this course. During the course, we have studied cases in academic freedom violations. And the main was Ilham Tohti's case, uh, who was the professor in China, in one of the um, universities in China, and he was charged in separatism for his work and imprisoned. In the end of the course, we have created advocacy map, with the consideration of students opportunities, which I would like to share with you. And so our main goal was to spread information uh, about the case uh, through social media. In other words, to make people to know that the scholars 
one of the scholars are imprisoned in China. Others are locked in the concentration camps where they are subject to forced labor. So basically, we more oriented to use Instagram for retelling stories uh, and use powerful images and Twitter for organizing and spreading awareness and petition signing. This is um, our um, advocacy map. So we wanted to raise awareness about Uyghur's forced labor and the brands which are using it. Uh, utilize the internet since it is the best source in the current time of pandemic and carry out our campaign through the use of various existing social media accounts as well as to create new ones. Uh, we wanted to apply to different accounts with a million of followers on Instagram and ask them to make advertisements of our activity, make posts with the earliest news and information and use hashtags. Also, uh, we, can, we could use the hashtags uh, which already exist, uh, using by Jehel Ilham, um, she is the daughter of Ilham Tohti, uh, and uh, emphasize on stories of real people to touch the hearts of the audience, to publish articles, journals, and openness and spread them um, uh, in the framework of our university or beyond. So, and we planned to make uh, two kinds of petitions. The first one uh, was to, was against the companies that use forced Uyghur labor, uh, aware of the buyers to boycott those companies. The goal is to show companies that um, buyers uh, do not intend uh, to show companies that buyers do not intend to purchase something that was created by forced labor. And the second was uh, the petition uh, against uh, the conduct of 2022 Olympic Games. So um, simply saying no rights, uh, no games. We want to direct uh, this petition to the International Olympic Games uh, Committee, not to allow China to host 2022 Olympic Games. Uh, so what is the power of each of us as a students? So all of us, we can share the posts and spread the awareness about the issue. We can flood the comment section of the posts of companies using forced labor, using different hashtags. This will bring attention to the people associated with the brands and show unity. We can boycott the brands associated with Uyghur's forced labor. We can sign the petitions. We can voice our opinion regarding these human rights violations in our personal profiles, which will be a great way to spread the awareness. So um, why students uh, are so important in this work? So as a citizens, we have freedom of expression to raise our voices. As a students, uh, we have um, academic freedom, which allows us to raise the issue, express opinion and make further research on this or any other issue. This is a um, very important question, especially it was important for me as in the beginning was thinking uh, like what I can do and um, that I would not be able to participate or somehow help to those people is maybe I'm not talented enough or I don't have enough experience. However, after the words of Jehel, uh, who is Ilham Tohti's daughter, um, her words changed my mind as she said like, you may think that you cannot contribute, but when you sign the petition, you make the post or reject buying from brands which use Uyghur's forced labor, you already make a great contribution. So the main uh, feature that student should have um, is to be interested. So if you want to contribute, just be interested. Uh, and I would say the ability to wholeheartedly commit yourself to something uh, is a talent by itself. So uh, during the course, I realized that there are same rules uh, when you advocate uh, way when you make the advocacy. So first of all, we don't speak about politics. When something comes, uh, the question about politics, I would say here is no one who is right. Just those who left, left their families, left their uh, <clears throat> their homes. So we don't speak about politics. We don't blame uh, like political regimes of any country. We just speak about people uh, who are charged. We just speak about help to them. And another rule is do more good than harm because a lot of people under the threat uh, and their families are. That's why we should do more good than harm them. 
uh, challenges which we uh, may face is making sure that we are not overly emphasizing our own voices, creating or embellishing narratives. So why this is a challenge? Because we plan to use real stories and the real information. However, people may be afraid to share their stories because a lot of, of their relatives are still in China and they're under the threat, under the danger. Uh, another challenge was uh, sharing information that would not have any negative impact on the individuals always having consent, which means like this have the direct uh, connection to the second rule, do more good than harm. And we always have uh, <clears throat> the ability to retract statements, take down posts if we are requested to do so. Mm, because like at any stage, we should be able to stop because uh, lives of others may be under the threat. Um, so what are the lessons uh, that I have learned after this course? And here I will try to answer the question, what tiny human can do? Uh, don't underestimate the power of your voices. Like mm, the power of one man doesn't amount to much. Uh, but uh, however, little strength we're capable of, we should try to do everything humanly possible to help those people. In turn, others will follow us and protect the ones they want the ones they're interested in, uh, the ones whose stories touch their hearts. So it seems like the least we tiny humans can to do for each other. So thank you. That's all. Thank you, Arisa. Um, Arisa, I have one follow-up question for you. Yeah. Um, and and that is, uh, it goes back to the, the question of the, 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 the tiny voices um, and power. Um, and I'm wondering in terms of also finding that, that sort of feeling that, that you did maybe have some power to make some change. Um, how did, what was it like also interacting in a global community? Did you, did that help? Because in your class and, um, and for those of you who don't know, I mean, as I mentioned, this was an international class. There were students from all over the, the world. So did, did that um, make you feel less tiny? <laughs> yes, um, simply saying, um, when there were students from all over the world, you see the different opinions, uh, different understandings. However, you understand that all of us, like all the students, uh, were in the one system of this education. And uh, when something in this system is broken, we should all try to fix it, right? So those uh, scholars who are imprisoned, they are also part of this uh, academic freedom system. That's why all of us should raise this question on the global level. That's why this global uh, voice is important as there are a lot of students uh, and uh, I understand it like as we're the core of this globe and changes should start from us where the foundation. However, if we will not try to um, to protect those who are like thinking, uh, think indifferent, doing different, making different, uh, who help us to think out of box. In the future, we will not govern uh, in this world. We will be those who are governed. That's why I think it's important that this question should arise on the global level. Wonderful, thank you. So interesting. Um, <laughs> Let, I'm going to move on to, to Fatima, and as I said, we'll come back to questions at the end. Um, and Fatima Ahuachi is the daughter of Halil Ahuachi, an electrical engineer currently serving a six-year sentence in Bahrain. Fatima has been a tireless advocate for her father, um, dedicated not only to affecting his release, but also in terms of raising the larger issue of the unjust persecution of scientists and academics such as her father. Several student seminars have worked on behalf of, of, of her father. And it is through this lens as an advocate, a colleague of the students, and most importantly, as a daughter, that, that we look forward to, to hearing her, her perspective um, on, on how these voices help create change. So Fatima, I hand it to you. Yes, hello, hello everyone. And it's really great to be here today with you all. Uh, thank you, Adam, thank you, Claire, and uh, thank you, Ariza. 
Um, I'll be talking about, yes, my father. Uh, he's 63 years old. Uh, you can see him here and here as well. Um, he's imprisoned in Bahrain. Um, he's not a criminal. Uh, he's a scholar. Uh, he's exactly the sort of person that uh, the government fears, educated, articulate, uh, persuasive, and with strong international connections and networks. Um, he studied electrical engineering uh, in London uh, at Imperial College, uh, Imperial College, yeah, in the mid 1970s. He spent 14 years uh, teaching in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, where I was myself born there and my brothers. Um, actually, he is now detained in Joe prison. Uh, his current situation with the COVID-19, uh, we are allowed to only uh, hear him on, on the phone for 10 minutes uh, because the, the visits were banned uh, after the COVID-19 since March. So last time we saw him was in, in March, yeah, March 2020. Um, Scholars at risk actually have been working on his case now for six years. My father is uh, charged uh, with unfair uh, uh, charges, uh, sentenced to 10 years in prison and spent already six years in prison. Um, my father's activism actually started when he was young, uh, when he was studying in London, along with the, the well-known human rights defender, Abdul Hadi Khwaja, which is also in prison. Uh, he's a Danish citizen. Um, all my father did is uh, try to uh, raise uh, human rights uh, cases in Bahrain. Uh, uh, he wanted a better uh, human rights uh, uh, condition in Bahrain. Um, he was arrested in 2014. This is the second arrest as he was arrested uh, during the uprising in 2011 also in Bahrain uh, when uh, it took place, the, the people took the streets for reforms. Um, uh, the, I actually today would like to mention how, uh, how this uh, great work that scholars at risk have been doing along with the students and uh, with their collaboration, actually, they were raising awareness. They kept uh, this case live, live for six years, actually. Today, we are speaking about it after six years. Because of the work they are doing, uh, these students, they worked on different events. They organized events. Uh, they were active on social media. Uh, they were active on their campuses. Uh, they were in contact with me. Uh, they raised uh, and submitted the submission to the UN, letters to the government of Bahrain. Um, they even uh, spread the br brochures all over. Uh, they sent it to me all the way to Bahrain along with the supportive bracelets uh, that, like the one I'm wearing. Um, I actually tried to tell my father about these uh, uh, supportive actions through the few minutes that we have with him over the phone and uh, previously during the visits. Mentioning this to him, it's not, it doesn't, it, it doesn't give only hope to us as a family of imprisoned scholars, but it also gives hope to, to the imprisoned scholar himself, imprisoned. When my father, the last thing we wanted is to be silent about this illegal and unfair imprisonment. So, uh, we have all these voices from all over the globe, uh, students who are creative, uh, finding creative ways. People hearing from the students is, is different than hearing only from Amnesty or only from uh, the organization itself. Um, it made different, it, it makes different. Uh, last time my father was uh, taken to solitary confinement just for speaking uh, to the police about uh, the actions uh, and the poor conditions that happen inside the prison. He was kept only for three days, not for seven days. It was because of all the media pressure that happens and that there are people who are following around the world. Uh, these students who does the, all, the, all the work along with us as a family. Um, and therefore, I wanted to send out this message. I wanted to say how it's effective, actually.
Um, I also believe that uh, Bahrain imprisoned my father uh, because they know that he he will have uh, a strong uh, strong personality as a scholar in the community and trying to shut down his voice uh, with the uh, with this with the scholar at risk and with the student themselves we made this uh, voice heard uh, even during inside prison now whenever my father wants to take a step inside prison he knows that there are people following up and uh, they're standing with him yeah Fatima, may I ask, um, you know, I know one of the concerns that people often have is that they might make things worse um, mm -hmm. for, you know, um, uh, you know, either for the family or, or for the scholar. And it sounds as though you have not experienced that in this case, that the advocacy has perhaps, um, as you mentioned, even helped at times or in terms of during his current condition. Yes, um, it it may it is really uh, it's really strong actually because uh, as I as I mentioned the students uh, are working on a global uh, global uh, level, uh, which is uh, fo and following up closely and uh, trying to reach out through uh, the social media and. Um, through different uh, panels uh, and uh, not only by the, the certain reports uh, that's been handled. So these makes a difference uh, because uh, they, make, they make our voice, uh, the present voice heard without stop for all past years. This is a way that it makes uh, the government knows that there is awareness, uh, there's someone watching, th someone following up, uh, knowing what's happening. And that's way it makes a difference. Yeah, really, really interesting. And well, I have one more question for you. And I know this comes up um, in other times I've been on calls with you. Um, and that is the question of you're talking to us from Bahrain right now. And, mm -hmm. and the question always is often is, how is it that you're able to talk about this? Um, and are you concerned when you, you know, um, not only how, but are you concerned talking about this um, um, so freely right now? Yes, I understand. Um, we have in prison uh, lawyers, we have students in Bahrain, we have uh, children, we have people like my father, scholars. So uh, what else? What, what worse can they do? They, they imprisoned everyone. Uh, they tried over the years to not let everyone speak up, uh, to ban the protests and all. And therefore we had those actually students, our voice, because we don't have the freedom of expression here, but we have the students, we have you, we have everyone else speaking on behalf of us. Um, my father decided also to speak up and not to stay silent. And therefore, I, I also followed this path. And uh, today we cannot uh, stand still. They, they imprisoned uh, everyone. They, uh, they sentenced him to 10 years already. They, re they actually refused the last uh, time the lawyer also uh, tried, to, uh, get, tried to find for him alternative sentence, but to, do, to be out of prison during this situation and uh, how it was dangerous over the COVID-19 inside presence, which is very crowded in Bahrain. But it was refused and it was denied. So that's why we 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 decided not to be silent as well and speak up today. And yours feel safe doing that? <laughs> safe, uh, actually, safety, is a critical thing here. We, we, we cannot feel safe all the time. And this is the reason we speak up for having more freedom. Uh, this is the reason we want, we, we want uh, our, the next generations. I have a son called Khalil as well. He's two years now. And uh, for him, we want a better future. And that's why we are speaking up. Um, and I also want to just emphasize, and, and we can start taking questions now if people have them, um, you know, you, you do bring up students because we've been talking a lot about scholars, but there are, you know, um, sort of established academics and scholars, but in fact, there are many students and many graduate students um, from around the world um, who, who are also being um, jailed and, and threatened um, for, for many of these 
um, same reasons. And in fact, coming back to the case of Wilhelm Todi, um, his when he was arrested, as were his students, um, because they were presumed to be under his his influence, um, um, if, if you will. Uh, so, did your father have students that were um, arrested as well, in connection yes, with uh, him? Yes, the, my father was teaching uh, university students in Bahrain and uh, students in schools, and we have a few of them also in prison. And uh, actually, my father continued to do that even inside prison. He's continuing to educate people. Hmm. And uh, Bahrain shows people that it's, it is interested in education and that it supports education. And therefore, we do speak up all the time about it because uh, there should be a solution by the government to stop all of this. Thank you. Do we have questions? I mean, you, again, you can put them in the chat or just hit the little raise hand button and I'm happy to, to call on you if other, otherwise I've got a, I've got a million questions I can ask, but, but. Um... I had a question. Yes. A comment. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, uh... Just a second. Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, Ilya Kapovich. Uh, so um, I currently serve as the chair of the Human Rights Committee of the American Mathematical Society. So I also deal with quite a few cases where we have to speak up on behalf of uh, uh, imprisoned uh, uh, scientists and also just scientists whose uh, human rights uh, uh, had been uh, uh, violated. Uh, I did know about uh, scholars at risk. I didn't know actually that uh, students were involved. So I have a few questions and comments. Uh, so uh, for the future, maybe some suggestions uh, for Claire and for the other students who are involved in this work. Uh, so what I myself found uh, to be one of the most difficult aspects, uh, in particular in dealing with faraway places like the former Soviet Union, uh, uh, Belarus, uh, Russia, uh, you know, some of the other uh, former Soviet Union countries is um, uh, getting sort of non uh, getting public uh, 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 so we get a lot of information which comes from private sources uh, but it is harder to get anything uh, 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 which uh, sort of uh, which is even posted in uh, on social media or in the news uh, and uh, when I try to convince uh, 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 you know American mathematical society or other bodies to issue a statement they usually want to see something which is available publicly even if it is only posted on Facebook or in other places on social media so m my feeling now is that uh, if student students who are involved in this work uh, you know especially if they are located in the U.S., uh, you know, can um, uh, uh, can help this uh, making this information available. That would actually be very helpful for organizations like us. Uh, uh, you know, so, so I apologize. Uh, you know, so that's me, uh, because uh, uh, we get a lot of these reports which come from individual people, but uh, uh, so they're somewhat difficult to substantiate, and I have a difficult time sometimes convincing. Uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, people like in the AMS to act on them. Uh, so that's my comment about this. Claire, I'm sure you have a lot of experience in this, uh, you know, in the, the um, scenario that, that Ilya is bringing up of having, you know, trying how, how you document, um, you know, what, what you're hearing or what's being reported to you. I'm curious how some of that process perhaps. Sure, well, first of all, Ilya, thank you because what I am taking from you is that it would be helpful for us to you know, maybe share some of the research and share some of our findings um, so that you can point to it in your work. Um, yep. And we'll definitely um, try and do that. Uh, you're right. So for our monitoring project, we do try and verify every piece of information um, with two separate sources and those all need to be in the public realm. So we definitely you know, experience what you experience as well, where there are reports of, you know, wrongful dismissals or intimidation or, um, or even imprisonment um, where it's just not available. There's nothing out there. You only hear from one person. Um, we, you know, we always need to grow our network, um, but, you know, we have found it enormously helpful to you know, develop relationships over the years with, you know, experts 
um, in the regions that we're working on. Um, and they can help us figure out whether a situation is even feasible. So that's usually where we start. Like, does this even sound like something that would happen? Um, and if we can say yes, then we look for alternative ways to you know, find documentation. Um, you know, sometimes that's talking to a colleague off the record, you know, without citing them by name, um, but just finding out whether this did happen. Um, and if we are comfortable, uh, you know, if we can verify it, even if we can't say who, who we verified it with, then we can publish it. And then that's information that you could use. Um, uh, right. uh, but I also just wanted to say that even if there are student groups here in the US who do this human rights work, if they themselves can create some kind of uh, um, yeah. public posting for us, uh, you know, that, that that alone would already be actually helpful, even if they do it ahead of you, you know, or independently from you, that kind of thing would be actually quite helpful. No, that's really, that's really helpful to hear. Um, I, will, I should clarify that, you know, we scholars at risk vets all of our cases first, and then we share case information with the students. So we, you know, only feel comfortable asking them to take action on cases where we have taken action. So they probably would be working with us on, on. Okay. The case. Um, but I take your point <clears throat> and I completely understand where you're coming from. And we'd love to see We'd love to help other organizations and academic associations take action. So I appreciate your comment. I, I'd add it because it's probably, I don't know if it's if we've made it clear or not as well, that the, the, um, the at least the student seminars as we work on them are also global. So they're not just um, American um, institutions. So there are seminars running um, throughout Europe, um, in Canada, um, so that, um, to, to that point that sometimes these collective voices and collective bits of information can, can further strengthen um, the, um, at least the, the, the sort of evidence chain, um, you know, that, that this is not just coming from one pocket, but, but, but collectively coming from, from different parts of the world um, as well. Other questions? I thought I saw a hand raised a second ago. Um, Claire, well, I have one for another one for you. Um, is um, have you what are patterns and frequencies you've seen in attacks recently? Are they change? Are they increasing attacks on higher education? Are they are there pockets of the world where they seem to be decreasing and increasing? And what what's the particular? I guess in think of in terms of thinking of sciences for these purposes. Sure, um, I actually would. Uh refer everyone to um, a recently published index this year called the Academic Freedom Index, which was developed in part by GPPI in Berlin um, and with, in partnership with a surveying um, company called VDEM. Uh, they have been tracking ac like developments in academic freedom over the past, like I think since 1919 or 1920. And then they issued in their report um, uh, an examination of uh, or an analysis of each country that they were able to collect data on for the past five years, like whether a country is um, improving over the past five years or um, you know, getting worse. Uh, so I think that's an excellent resource. Um, from our perspective in terms of whether attacks are increasing or decreasing, you know, they're, they're just very prevalent. It's hard to say because we, you know, to our knowledge, we're the only ones tracking attacks on the higher education sector. Um, and we started doing so in 2011. We felt like we had enough data by 2015 to issue our first free to think report. And we've been issuing that report annually every year. Um, and each year, the number that we report increases. That being said, we've been getting better at doing this. And so, you know, we've only had the smart search technology for the past two years. Um, and so, that has helped enormously. Uh, so I, it's hard to say. Um, I will say that this year we, we are focusing um, primary chapters of our report on India, uh, Yemen, um, Hong Kong, and China. Uh, we have several features on student attacks on student protesters in various countries 
uh, and legislative attacks on academic freedom, especially in Eastern Europe. Uh, and so I, I'm looking forward to sharing that report with everybody uh, in about a month when it's finalized. <laughs> Um, so sorry for the roundabout answer, Adam. Basically, it's hard to say, but they are, I, I would say that, you know, attacks on the scientific community, on the academic community, you know, it, it is a significant problem. Um, we often refer to it as a, you know, crisis of attacks, a phenomenon of attacks. It's hard to say if it's increasing or decreasing at this point. And just, of course, then you throw COVID in there and it makes things all the more difficult to assess in that learning is no longer occurring on campuses in the same way. And so attacks aren't necessarily happening in the same form, but they're still happening. Um, and so what we're reporting on, you know, in terms of Zoom bombings and things like that are different than what we were reporting on a year ago. Mm -hmm. And there is a section on the, the US too in the... Um, there is a section on... Uh, attacks or threats to scientists um, who are speaking out about government's handling of COVID-19. And mm -hmm. so there is discussion of the U.S. in that chapter, as well as China. Um, and I am forgetting where else, but yes, that's where the U.S. is most discussed. Fatima, I'm still thinking of, of Ilya's question um, to, to some degree, and I'm thinking about your father in, in terms of, was there a systematic, um, was, you know, were, were his records suddenly hard to get? Was, in, you know, was his past suddenly starting to get um, erased? So for example, I'm thinking also of, uh, well, Ariza mentioned Johar Ilham, the daughter of Ilham Toti, when she ended up in the United States and she was still a college student, um, suddenly her records were not available. You know, the, 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 the university in China could not, you know, find her records um, um, anymore. Um, so she essentially had to start over her college experience here. Um, I'm wondering if your father experienced something at that level of, of you know, systematically. It's, it's actually, uh, I, I mentioned that he was arrested during 2011. When he was released, uh, he had to start all over again because they have uh, uh, they have damaged all his work. Actually, everything that he had in the house was damaged. So when he come out, he will not be able to to do it or to or to struggle all over again with with everything. He was also put on ban, which he wasn't able to travel until his second arrest in 2014. So I feel it's a, systema a systematic thing because he's getting targeted in a way that um, they don't want him to continue doing what he's doing. So he was first put in prison. When he was released, his work was not there. He was banned to travel. And now again, he's in, in jail. And also we cannot uh, like renew everything of his documents and uh, that's why when, whenever I need any uh, any identity for him, it, it's uh, it's already expired and we cannot renew. So so basically, there are so many confusion when you are in prison, and the worst is that the condition inside uh, is very poor. But uh, it it gets better and better whenever you raise awareness because he tells me all the time. He tells me they hear what you do they read what you do on they follow you on twitter they check they know they come for me whenever uh, there is a noise out there so they come uh, trying to make th things better inside yeah it sort of nicely circles to ariza's tiny voice that in fact the voice is not so tiny sometimes that you know that that Correct. that post that you make on twitter might be something that Correct. helps the person on the other end have a better meal or be treated a little bit um, better yes. in, that, in that situation. It is. It is. Um, do we have any other questions from anybody? Otherwise we can, um, Claire, do you have any other avenues you would just share with people that, you know, per, per perhaps germane to this conference that other avenues people could follow? You mentioned amnesty and, um, 
Um, I mean, it depends on what chapters and clubs are on your campus. Um, I, I really think that one of the strongest or the best ways to conduct advocacy is with academic associations or scientific associations because scientists and academics are seen, you know, are, 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 are just, are, their voices are stronger because they are, are perceived to have you know, done their research and um, you know, they know what they're talking about. And so I think having, if, if there is, you know, an Ameri I don't know if American Chemical Society, for example, who we've partnered with in the past, um, has, does any, facilitates any student chapters. Um, but I do know that um, there is uh, consideration right now for forming a AAAS student section. Uh, and I think that's a great idea. Uh, I don't know if they would be able to conduct advocacy through that section, but if they were, then that would be a wonderful way for students on this call and at this conference to get involved. Um, I was actually on that note asked to share that um, there will be a meetup for student conference attendees um, this evening at seven o'clock Eastern time. Um, and it's to discuss the organizing of a student section for AAAS um, for the Science and Human Rights Coalition. Uh, so anyone interested in attending, I believe you can find the link through the conference webpage. Uh, but I, am, I, I very much support that effort and I think it could be a wonderful future partner. Yes, thank you. Well, on that note, you know, I would like to thank AAAS for having us and allowing us to, to, to talk and share the, all of this information with you. Um, and certainly any follow-up uh, questions that may come to mind, feel free to email me um, or Claire, and we can either answer or route it to the, 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 the people who can get you the answers. Um, I especially want to thank um, Arisa and um, Fatima um, for not only sharing so much um, um, on this call, but also sharing it um, in, um, you know, late at night in, in, in some cases um, and, and, um, and, and inspiring us to continue um, our work. And of course, Claire as well for all her tremendous work she does um, in making all of this happen. So, um, so we'll let Fatima and Ariza go to bed. We'll let Claire go back to bed, uh, maybe. <laughs> and, uh, and uh and let the rest of you head off to lunch perhaps so so thank you very much and again please reach out to us with questions um if they occur to you later um, um or if there's any way we can help so. thank you adam thank you so much and uh, can i just add one more thing uh during this COVID 19 uh, this brought us all together which is uh, fabulous and uh during the past times we were always as an activist banned from traveling. Myself, I was banned to travel previous uh, times. Uh, so this is a, a genius way to, to be together and discuss all of this, yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Ariza. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, AAAS. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.